So uh, today we have uh, Wasim Bakker, uh, who is uh, recently tenured at, at Princeton. We're delighted to have him uh, here for today's colloquium. So uh, just very briefly a little bit about Wasim. So he uh, did his graduate work um, at Harvard with Marcus Greiner and uh, was instrumental in uh, building up the first uh, quantum gas microscope, which has gone on to um, lead to all sorts of really interesting results looking at Hubbard uh, model systems. And so for his work during his PhD, he was awarded a thesis prize from DEMOP and uh, I'm look at my notes to get the name right, the uh, Newcomb Cleveland Prize for an outstanding um, publication in science for a real breakthrough. Um, so after that, he went on to work at MIT uh, for, with Martin Twierlein uh, for his postdoc looking at uh, spin-orbit coupled quantum gases and more recently, the past six years, has been at Princeton and was recently tenured there and he's won numerous awards along the way for uh, his groundbreaking work, in particular um, Sloan and Packard fellowships uh, among others. So uh, he'll tell us today about recent efforts to look at uh, Fermi systems uh, with a quantum gas microscope and uh, ARP, do ARP as measurements in systems. Thank you very much, Ben, for the kind introduction. Is the mic working? Yes. Center. There we go. Okay, great. Well, it's a pleasure to be here at Stanford. And uh, it's a very busy schedule today. Uh, okay, so. Uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you about the experiments we're doing at Princeton using these quantum gas microscopes, which are these wonderful tools that enable us to look at um, uh, these quantum gases and optical lattices done at the atomic level and uh, do quantum many-body physics uh, with them. So the, the overall goal of the, the work that happens in my lab is we would like to understand the behavior of strongly correlated materials. So these are examples of strongly correlated materials that people study in condensed matter, things like high temperature superconductors or fractional quantum hole <coughs> systems. And the common thing between all these materials are that the electrons have, uh, are strongly interacting with each other, and that leads to uh, new properties, exotic phases, that might be harnessed potentially for technological applications. And of course, um, in order to better engineer these materials, we'd like to understand them on a microscopic level, but that requires us to solve the challenging quantum network problem. So here's an example um, to illustrate this problem. So if you take this high temperature superconductor, uh, yttrium barium copper oxide underneath the hood, you see it's pretty scary. Um, if you try to, it's like almost impossible to try to do an ab initio simulation of everything going on in here with a classical computer. So uh, the first thing a condensed matter theorist would try to do is, of course, boil this down to a simplified model. Things might go wrong at that level. You might miss a lot of physics and boiling it down to the simplified model. But let's say you boil it down to this Hubbard model, which is a popular model for little grades. I'll, I'll discuss this model in detail later in the talk. OK, you can see it's a lot simpler. but it's still challenging to solve this model in the sense of, say, extracting a phase diagram of the system or solving for some dynamical properties like, say, measuring resistivity for this model. So uh, how do we deal with this? Well, uh, here's an approach suggested by Feynman a long time ago. Instead of uh, solving this system, uh, so this model on a classical computer, why not solve it on a quantum computer? And uh, this, this approach goes by the name of quantum simulation. Um, there are a lot of quantum simulators out there now based on different technologies, things like superconducting qubits or photons. Uh, my favorite simulator is these called atoms. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the system. So uh, these are basically very dilute gases um, that are sitting isolated in a vacuum chamber. The typical spacing between the particles is on the order of a micron. So much larger than the spacing in a solid between the electrons. And that means that we have to cool them to very, very low temperatures in order to start accessing quantum phenomena. So if we, so this is room temperature here, we have to go 12 orders of magnitude lower 
And at these temperatures here, basically the de Broglie wavelength of the, part of the particles uh, starts to approach the interparticle spacing and we enter into a regime of quantum degeneracy. Okay. That's where uh, our physics happens. And of course, uh, the question is how do you get there? Um, there has been decades of work uh, that got us to this point. Uh, there's uh, laser cooling techniques that can get us into the hundreds of microkelvins or millikelvin temperature scale. So what you're seeing here is a cloud of lithium atoms that is uh, trapped in a vacuum chamber in my lab. So this, this particular cloud here has roughly about a billion atoms. Uh, the size here is a few millimeters. The, the cloud is levitated using electromagnetic fields in the middle of a vacuum chamber. And it's scattering so much light that you can just see it with your bare eyes. Okay, this is the south of the picture, actually. Okay. Uh, and within a few milliseconds, lasers can cool down this cloud to the temperature of the of a So there's ten limits to, to how, how cold we can get with laser cooling. The photons are always, uh, the, the atoms are always carrying photons, so they're not quite depressed yet. If you want to get colder, we can load them into a conservative trap made with far off resonant light. So this is here, uh, something like the optical tweezers people use in biology, it's called an optical dipole trap, where uh, we can trap uh, some of the atoms in this magneto optical trap, and then proceed to cool them even further, simply by turning down the, the depth, the intensity of these <coughs> laser beams. So we, we use evaporative cooling, and that allows us to enter into this region quantum degeneracy at, uh, at the tens of nanokelvins or hundreds of nanokelvins temperature scale. Okay, so what happens next depends on what species of atom we're using. So uh, the atom we're using in my lab is this lithium-6 isotope, which has three protons, three neutrons, and three electrons. So that's an odd number, so this is a fermion, and so we end up with a degenerate Fermi gas at these very low temperatures. So this is starting to look like condensed matter, right? This is like the electrons you have in a solid. If we want to make the system look even more like electrons in a solid, we can try to add a band structure, okay? So the idea there is we can take a laser beam like this and use it to create standing waves of light uh, in 1D, in 2D, or 3D. So these go by the name of optical lattices. And the analogy here is the atoms are playing the role of the electrons in a solid, and this optical lattice is playing the role of the ionic potential in a solid. Okay. So this is essentially an enlarged model for a condensed matter system, where the spacings are microns instead of angstroms, okay, four orders of magnitude larger. Uh, uh, larger. And uh, the advantages of using the system are many, so here's a few listed here. So maybe the most important is of course, we, when we're engineering these Hamiltonians, we really understand them from first principles. Okay? When we write down a Hamiltonian, it's a very, very good description of what's going on, unlike in condensed matter where whatever you write down is at best a good approximation. In these Hamiltonians, we can really tune them. Okay? So we can change things like, let's say I want to change the hopping of the atoms between neighboring sites. You can simply change the depth of the lattice. Okay? You can change the interactions. You can change a lot of these things in real time. These are very clean systems. If you want to add dirt to the system, you can add it in a controlled way. Okay. Then the large spacing enters in two ways. One, it slows out the dynamics. So the typical dynamics happen on a millisecond time scale. Okay. Pretty slow, so it's easy to observe in the lab. But also for the particular experiments I'm going to be telling you about, it's useful for being able to image the system and to manipulate it using just like visible light or near infrared light. Okay, so what I'm going to be telling you about is we're going to basically take pictures uh, with uh, visible light off of these atoms of the degenerate gas. Uh, take a snapshot of the of, a, of uh, this many-body uh, quantum system. Okay. So so here's a picture. Um, this is basically a two-dimensional cast of fermions. It's lithium six sitting in a 2D lattice. And the way these experiments work is we start by producing this degenerate Fermi gas. And then we load it adiabatically into a lattice to quench the kinetic energy. So now the interactions play an important role. And then, then we enter into some quantum many-body state, which is characterized by strong, by correlations in the density or the spin. 
and we'd like to gain information about these correlations. So what we do is we quick once we prepare this correlated state, we can ramp the lattice depth by orders of magnitude to freeze uh, the density of the spin. So essentially we're projecting the many-body wave function onto a particular <coughs> realization. Okay. And now we can go and uh, scatter photons of the atoms to, to learn about their positions and the spin and so on. Each of these atoms that you're seeing here is scattered, we need to, to see it with bits to noise, it scatters about a thousand photons. <coughs> okay. um, when you're scattering photons, the atoms heat up. Okay, so they start to pop like you see in this picture, uh, if we're not very careful. Okay? This is a movie I'm showing just for fun, but typically in a real experiment, what we do is actually this light that we're eliminating the atoms with, it's also doing some laser cooling, but the temperature of the atoms doesn't get too large. We try to keep it well below the depth of the lattice so that we freeze the atoms on these sites and while we're scattering photons. And so we can very faithfully reconstruct a picture of the density or the spinning system. Um, and basically with losses and hopping rates with an exposure time of less than a percent. Okay, so now this is sort of the start of, uh, of, what, of a platform where we can study a lot of different uh, questions in main body physics. So here I want to focus on fermi Hubbard physics, but in my lab we're doing other kinds of physics like um, thermalization questions, localization, etc. Okay. But the natural Hamiltonian that we just get out of the system with no extra work is this Fermi Hubbard Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is a famous Hamiltonian that has been now studied for decades after Phil Anderson proposed that it might be a good model, starting model for understanding the behavior of high temperature superconductors. It's a simple Hamiltonian to write down, so there are just two terms in it. It's a, mo it's a model that describes uh, two species of fermions in a uh, single band model, and let's assume here that the fermions are moving in a square lattice, for example. Okay. So the fermions can do one of two things. They can either tunnel between neighboring sites, so basically this destroys the fermion site J and creates it on site I, and the matrix element for that is D. This only happens between neighboring sites. And the other sort of process that can happen is two fermions of opposite spin can land on the same side. You can't have two fermions of the same spin land on the same side because of the poly blocking. Okay, this is a single band model. But if two fermions of opposite spins land on the same side, they will have a strong interaction here. Okay, this is a purely on-site interaction. We can tune both of these things in the lab. We can change the barrier depth to control T. And we can change the interaction energy using a tool that I don't want to go into. It's called Feshbach resonance, but in the lab, it's as simple as changing the magnetic field. Okay. So we have full control over the parameters of this Hamiltonian over orders of magnitude. So we can uh, uh, okay. So we can change this U over T. We can also change the temperature of the system. We can change uh, the filling of the system. How many atoms we have per lattice site. So we can explore the whole phase diagram of the <coughs> system. Now, as I was saying, this, people have been working on this Hamiltonian for, for decades now, but theoretically the situation is that still the low temperature phases of this Hamiltonian are not very well understood. Um, and the question we would like to answer with our quantum simulators is, how much of the phenomenology of the Coupe rates does this Hubbard model reproduce? So, since we don't know the phase diagram of the, of the Hubbard model, let me show you a coup rate phase diagram. Okay. So, this is a phase diagram in temperature and doping. Uh, by doping here, I mean, I call the system undoped if there's an equal number of fermions and sites on average. You call the system doped if, let's say, whole doped if I take some fermions out, or particle doped if I add some fermions in. Okay. So, let me start uh, here at zero doping and tell you a little bit about this phase diagram. So, uh, in these coup rates, the interactions are pretty strong. Um, U over T, roughly, let's say about eight. And so, this strong interaction suppresses density fluctuations. And the parent compound for these systems is a mod insulator where you have one atom per site up to a little bit of quantum fluctuations. So, this is an insulator because of the strong interactions. 
If you now lower the temperature, then you get into you get spin ordering in the system. You get uh, a Heisenberg antiferromagnet. magnet. So these things are th these phases are phases we know exist in the Hubbard model because we can actually do quantum Monte Carlo calculations on the Hubbard model without the so-called fermion sign problem. So these are relatively easy calculations to do there. Now, if you start to dope the system, you run into this fermion sign problem, and that's where the theory gets really hard. But that's where all the interesting physics happens in this in the cooperates. So you have the D-wave superconductor at low temperatures, and then even in the normal state, you have some interesting phases like the strange metal and the pseudo gap that I would like to discuss later. Okay, so let's first start with, with the easy phases first and see how they appear in our system. Uh, one difference in our system compared to a condensed matter system is that the electron density in a solid is uniform, while here uh, the system is sitting in a trap. Right, so the, these lattices are made using Gaussian laser beams, and the atoms are sitting near the center of this Gaussian, so they, they experience some sort of harmonic trapping potential. And the density is varying in the system. Okay. So we like to think of our systems in the local density approximation. So essentially we think of it as patches of uh, systems with uh, a, a well-defined local chemical potential. Okay. And this local chemical potential is varying across the trap. So near the center of the trap, in, in, in this, for this particular cloud, this cloud is taken, a picture taken at a large B over T of about 8, similar to the cuprates. And the chemical potential in the center of the trap, the local chemical potential, is chosen so that it lies within the MOT gap. Okay? So we expect there to see a MOT insulator where we have one atom per site. Now our microscope has a resolution which is very comparable to the lattice spacing. So we can't tell that there's one atom per site here, but whenever you have a missing atom like here or here or here, you see it. Okay? So we know that this is a square lattice. We can overlay a grid structure on top of this, and we can with high fidelity tell whether we have an atom or a site or not. Now as you go towards the edge of the trap, you go from a molten slating phase, the chemical potential drops towards the edge of the trap, and so you go into a metallic phase. So essentially we're taking a cut through the phase diagram by looking at these real space images. Okay, so now let's try to add more atoms to the trap and see what happens. So now the central chemical potential is going up, and eventually it can be in the band gap. Okay, so at that point you get a band insulator in the center of the trap, where you have basically a spin up and a spin down on each side. And when you shine resonant light on such a system, what happens is a process called light-assisted collisions, where the sphere of atoms gets ejected from the trap. Okay? So where the band insulator used to live, we see an empty hole, and that's surrounded by, at lower chemical potential, this, this malt insulator. Okay. So uh, the next interesting phase to look at, at half filling, would be the antiferromagnet. And for that, you, you need to measure the spin. Okay. So our particular microscope doesn't measure the spin directly because uh, as I told you, we, we need to collect about roughly a thousand photons to get a good signal to noise image of, of a single atom. And when I say spin here, these are, I'd like to say they're hyperfine states of the atom, this is what we call spin. Okay. So we pick two hyperfine metastable ground states and uh, we call them spin up and spin down. So if you shine resonant light on, on, uh, on a system, you quickly jumble up the spin within a few photons. Right? So in order to learn about this antiferromagnet, what we do is uh, we eliminate one of the spin states by shining a resonant pulse of light that eliminates one of the spin states, and then we just image the other spin states. So let's say we just are looking at the spin-offs. And we get pictures like this. Okay? So if you look carefully at this picture, you can see maybe a little patch of antiferromagnetic or checkerboard structure in this, uh, in this picture. Okay? So, you don't expect this to be everywhere. You remember in the phase diagram I showed you, the antiferromagnet is only close to half filling. Once you start to dope the system, you go away from half filling, the antiferromagnet anti correlations go away. So the, before we eliminated the spin downs, if you looked at this picture, the modern slater would only be kind of in this region. Okay? But even within the modern slating region, you don't expect antiferromagnet everywhere because this is a quantum antiferromagnet, right? Even if it were at zero temperature, there's a lot of quantum fluctuations. This is the Heisenberg antiferromagnet where the spin, the Niel-Ogre parameter, can rotate around. So only if it's pointing 
along your imaging axis uh, in the basis that you're trying to do the measurement, then you would see checkerboard correlations. If, you, if, you, if it's like this, then you don't see anything. Okay? Furthermore, the system is at finite temperature, so these correlations have a finite range. As a matter of fact, so, so the way we, we do thermometry on these clouds is by using these antiferromagnetic correlations. So what we can do is we can take lots of these kinds of pictures and we'll see these antiferromagnetic patches appear here and there in the cloud. And if we take them over and over, we can uh, extract the spin-spin correlation function, which is what's shown here. Uh, so basically this is saying, let's say this is the central side. If I displace by one side away, that side is anti-correlated, this side is correlated. Okay? So by looking at these pictures, we can uh, extract the spin-spin correlation function and compare it to quantum Monte Carlo calculations, which uh, with the temperature as a fit parameter. And that's how we do thermometry on these plots. Okay? So the state of the art right now in our systems is temperature on the order of 30% of the time. Okay, so now these phases I told you are all there we knew in the Hubbard model. We can see them in our experiment, but now the interesting physics is once we start to do it. So that's where the rest of the story is going. Okay, so let me first tell you about uh, this strange metal phase. Um, so the kinesmatic community has a lot of confusing terminology here. It's strange metals, bad metals. So, so let me try to ex explain briefly what these mean. So let me first start with what a good metal is. Okay, so this is basically uh, a metal which can be described in terms of quasi-particles. And these quasi-particles carry the various conserved quantities like charge or spin or energy. Now, these quasi-particles are moving around. They're scattering off each other every mean free path. We can relate that to a momentum relaxation rate through the Fermi velocity. And like we teach our students in freshman physics, we can relate this uh, momentum relaxation rate to resistivity uh, through a Druda like formula. So now if you start imagining to heat up this, uh, this quasi-particle system, then the mean free path will shrink, but it, it cannot, in a quasi-particle system, become shorter than the interparticle spacing, right? That's just common sense. Um, it also can, in a lattice system, get shorter than the lattice spacing. So, so there are these sort of lower bounds on the mean free path that go by the name of Montial theoretical limits on the mean free path. Experimentally, it's easier to measure the resistivity. So if you look at the resistivity, as you heat up the system, it has to saturate at some value. So this would be the MIR limit on the resistivity. OK, so that's one thing we know about quasi-particle systems. Another thing we know is how the resistivity scales with, with temperature. And in a, in a condensed matter system, there are many different reasons why you can have resistivity. You can have disorder, you can have um, uh, phonons, you can have scattering between the particles. The nice thing about our systems is that they're very clean, there's no disorder, and the lattice is rigid, so there's no phonons. So any resistivity in our system comes purely from scattering between the atoms. Okay? So we, uh, we can isolate the mechanism for resistivity. And if you now use Fermi liquid theory combined with Boltzmann transport theory, you find that this resistivity scales like the square of the temperature in a quasi-particle system. Okay, so now let's go away from this and start to increase the interaction, destroy the quasi-particles, and ask what happens. So in the large class of materials like the cuprates and nictites, what one observes experimentally is that the resistivity goes through the MIR bound, and just completely ignoring it. The resistivity just keeps going uh, increasing as you increase the temperature. So that's what's known as a bad metal. Okay. Furthermore, it's, uh, what people often see in these materials is that the resistivity scales linearly with the temperature. In the cuprates, this is known as a strange metal. Okay. Now this linear interior resistivity is a huge mystery in, in the cuprates. And it's hard to disentangle whether the effects of this linear interior resistivity is whether it's coming from phonons or whether it's coming from interparticle scattering. Now, in our Hubbard system, I explained that we only have this interparticle scattering as the mechanism for resistivity. And so we can now ask the question of whether a Hubbard system exhibits this linear interior resistivity. OK, so resistivity is unfortunately a hard thing for cold atom experiments to measure. It's not so straightforward just to clean the sample or a current, right, measure voltage. 
there's been a lot of previous work trying to kind of mimic setups like that, where you say put a channel and connect to reservoirs and try to measure resistivity. Unfortunately, these, most of these experiments end up measuring properties of the channel, not about resistivity. <coughs> so we had a different take on this. Um, so rather than try to measure the resistivity directly, what we did is we, we measured a more microscopic quantity, which is the charge diffusivity. And that can be related to the resistivity or the conductivity, the inverse of the resistivity, through this famous nernst einstein relation. Okay, so the conductivity is the product of the diffusivity and the compressibility. So the compressibility is a quantity called atom people have known how to measure for a long time. If you, if you uh, put the gas, let's say, in a harmonic trap, I already showed you that the local chemical potential is varying. We can look at how the density varies in response to this variation of the chemical potential. And simply by taking a derivative of the density profile, we obtain the compressibility. So, the, the, so this thermodynamic quantity, that's easy to measure. The hard part is how to get at this diffusivity. So for that, we had to come up with a new technique. And the idea is as follows. First, we wanted to do a clean measurement where we're not kind of uh, worried about, we, we don't want to worry about uh, an inhomogeneous system where the doping is varying. So for this particular experiment, we actually took our harmonic trap and flattened it over some region by adding some additional light. So we can project light through the microscope that gives us sort of a box potential. Okay? So now we have a uniform density. The doping is about 20% whole doped. Now, the idea behind the measurement is we're going to further pattern the light that we're shining on the, on the atoms. So we can do this with a projector chip, a spatial light modulator where we can put some arbitrary pattern on it and then project it onto the atoms through the microscope. And in particular, what we did here is we added, on top of the lattice, a long wavelength modulation. Okay, that creates basically a modulation of the density of the, of the, in the cloud. So you can see these stripes that we've created in the density here of, of this hover system. Okay. Another idea is we're going to switch off suddenly the long wavelength modulation. <coughs> and let the atoms diffuse into the lattice. And by watching this, how they diffuse and the loss of contrast of this charge density wave, we back out uh, a, a, a diffusivity for the charge. Okay. Okay, so, so let me show you some pictures. Uh, so this is uh, the initial cloud with stripes at equals zero. We switch off the modulation and very quickly that modulation disappears okay, within a few tunneling times. So let's track how the amplitude of this modulation now changes with time. Um, this is all happening in a strongly correlated system with u over t about 8, and the doping, as I said, close to this quantum critical point of group rates of about 20%. So what happens depends on the wavelength of the modulation that we put on. So uh, this data here, this particular data, is for a modulation with wavelength of five sites. And what you see is the amplitude kind of switches sign and then kind of undergoes like an under damped oscillation. Okay. This is not what you expect from diffusion. With diffusion, you would expect the amplitude of, of this charge density wave to just decay exponentially. Right? But this is not what we see for short wavelengths. Now, if you go to a longer wavelength, let's say we go to 10 sites, it becomes more damped. At 15 sites, it's even more damp. 20 sites, it's almost completely damped. Okay, so you might even think about fitting this with an exponential and saying this is diffusive behavior. Okay. okay, so now we had to come up with a simple hydrodynamic model to understand this data. Um, and uh, the model is just these two equations here. The first equation is charge conservation, which obviously holds true. And the second equation is a more phenomenological one. So if you want to reproduce diffusion, then your go-to equation is fixed law, right? You'd say the current is proportional to the gradient of the density with the proportionality constant being the diffusivity. Now, that would explain the behavior at long wavelengths, the exponential decay, right? But we need to also get this under damped oscillation. How do we get that? Well, the issue there is that if you have this modulation and you switch it off, the current cannot build instantaneously. It has to take some time to build up. So what we're saying in this equation is that the current relaxes at some rate gamma to a steady state, which is given by the value given by fixed law. 
So fixed law is basically the steady, once this current stops changing, we get fixed law. Okay. So there are two parameters basically in this model, the gamma and the diffusivity, the current relaxation rate and the diffusivity. If you combine these two equations, you get a second order differential equation for a harmonic oscillator. Okay. So uh, the, the, relax, the, the, decay, the decay rate is, the damping rate is gamma, and uh, the frequency squared is this wave vector of the modulation squared, and gamma d, so sort of like a speed of sound squared here. Okay. So you can see by varying the wavelength of this k vector, we can cross over, we can change this omega to gamma, and so we can cross over from under damped to over damped, or from a diffusive mode to a sound mode. <coughs> Okay, so basically we can fit all our data at different wavelengths to these two parameters and extract them at a given temperature. And then we can go ahead and vary the temperature to study how these diffusivity and relaxation rate depend on temperature. And this is what we see. So as you lower the temperature, the diffusivity goes up and the current relaxation goes down. This is what you expect, you know, as you lower the temperature, the poly blocking closes scattering channels and so the system the diffusivity goes up. Okay, so what, I'm, what I want to emphasize here is this is some sort of non-trivial dependence on the temperature. And the temperature scale is not the one you're used to here from condensed matter. These are very high temperatures, like 8 times the ton length. That's like tens of 10,000 Kelvin or so. So if you were looking at the cuprates, they would have a long mountain by then. So this is a regime we can only explore these models. The lower end of the temperature scale we can explore, which is about 30% of the ton length, that's near the high temperature scale of what people, people start to when they're, when they're studying strange metals with the coup rates, maybe up to 1,000 Kelvin, that's kind of the lower end of our temperature scale. Okay? So we like to call this like an intermediate temperature regime where we're exploring. You'll see why intermediate in a second. <coughs> okay, so that's, this, this diffusivity is one ingredient we need for the resistivity. The other ingredient we need is the compressibility. Okay? So I told you how we measure it. Compressibility, fortunately, is also something we can calculate easily with quantum Monte Carlo because it's an equal time density correlation. So you can relate the Cooper formula to the compressibility, and these are relatively straightforward to compute. That's this green box here. It agrees very well with the experimental data. So now we have a compressibility that varies with temperature in a non-trivial way, and a diffusivity that varies in a non-trivial way. So in condensed matter, the situation you're used to is you're at very low temperatures where the compressibility has saturated. And as Sean Hartman will tell you, the, any dependence of the resistivity has to come from the diffusivity. Okay? There's another way you can get a linear T resistivity, which is when you go to super high temperatures, there's a trivial way you can get, um, you can get a linear T resistivity. At those very high temperatures, if you do a high temperature expansion, the compressibility goes as 1 over the temperature. <coughs> Uh, and the diffusivity is expected to saturate. Okay? So that gives you a 1 over t for the conductivity or linear interior resistivity. So we're kind of in neither of these regimes. We're seeing both the compressibility and the resistivity vary. Uh, so as we change, like, so the high temperature regime would be for temperatures well above the bandwidth, which is this 8t for our 2D system. Okay? okay, so now we combine these two quantities the compressibility and the diffusivity, and we find a beautiful straight line, okay? So, um, the, the resistivity violates the MIR bound, but that's not so surprising. I already showed you the, compre the compressibility at high temperatures goes like 1 over T, so eventually at high temperatures it goes to zero, and you expect like to violate the MIR bound in this model. But this linear interior resistivity is something we still don't understand. Um, we don't have an understanding of what's the physics that's producing this straight line. Uh, surprisingly, despite you know the long history of studying the Hubbard model theoretically, people hadn't computed this this resistivity as a function of temperature um, with any exact techniques. So today I was talking to Tom Devereaux, and he, I was asking him why hadn't they done this. So shortly after we actually did this, these experiments, uh, his group actually did uh, QMC on on the Hubbard model, and they found over the same temperature range a linear interior resistivity. Um, we also collaborated with various theory collaborators uh, to, to compare to our data. So this is a finite temperature Lanchus calculation on four by four sites. Um, it takes a month to do the calculation like that. But uh, it doesn't even access the lowest temperatures we can reach 
because four by four sites, there's a lot of finite sensor factors that go to lower and lower temperatures. Uh, so the lowest temperatures they can reach are about t equals one t on tunneling, while we can reach about a factor of three times <coughs> lower. Uh, this is without any free parameters, it fits very well to the experiment. This is dynamical mean field theory, a popular technique used in condensed matter, and it doesn't agree. So this is, you know, it's not surprising. This is an approximate technique. It only is exactly infinite dimensions. Uh, there's been later work that uh, tried to address any of these verdicts corrections that might help uh, with agreeing with the exact methods like finite temperature lashes. And one of the exciting things I found was people working on these different numerical techniques weren't even talking to each other, and the experiment was the thing that forced them to start comparing against each other. Okay, so, so that's the situation with uh, the strange metal, which might not be quite in the temperature scale, which would you call strange metals for, for the cuprates. It's, it's, like I said, it's in a different temperature regime. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, our plans for how to start exploring uh, the pseudo-gap regime of these uh, Hubbard models. And uh, in, in condensed matter, a popular tool for studying pseudo-gaps is photo emission spectroscopy. So the idea there is you send in a photon onto this quantum uh, minimally system, you excite a particle from this interacting system, uh, you eject this electron and you go and measure its energy and momentum and you back out the, the single particle excitations of this minimally system. So what is it measuring? Well, ultimately, <coughs> if you want to compare to like Monte Carlo or something, what they need to compute is a Green's, target Green's function that tells you how the excitations propagate in this many-body system. If you take the imaginary part of that, you get the momentum resolved density <coughs> of states that we call the spectral function. And what you measure in the experiment is the spectral function multiplied by uh, the Fermi function. Okay? So that's ultimately the thing we, we observe. Okay, so what are these pseudo-gaps? Well, in, in a large class of strongly correlated systems, what one observes is that there is a depression in the, spe uh, in the spectral function near the Fermi energy, uh, even when the system is in its normal state. So this is surprising because in BCS theory, the gap only opens once you go, once the system becomes superconducting. But here, this happens at a different temperature scale, which people call T star, you open, start to open up a gap. People have observed this in uh, cold atom systems. So ARPIS was pioneered uh, in a group of uh, Debbie Chin, to study, where she looked, used it to look at um, unitary Fermi gases that also exhibit a pseudo gap. And of course, it's observed in things like uh, cuprates. And uh, the origin of the pseudo gap is highly controversial in these systems. So, when we were, the extension of this ARPIS technique to lattice systems proved to be technically challenging. And uh, since this is the first time ARPIS is being uh, implemented in a lattice system, we thought we'd like to test it in a system where we can actually go and compare to, to Quantum Monte Carlo uh, to sort of benchmark uh, the technique, make sure our technique works before trying to go and apply it to a doped repulsive system where there's a fermion sign problem and calculating everything is very hard. So a good test bed is the attractive Hubbard model, not the repulsive Hubbard model. Now we switch to attractive interactions, which we can do in our systems using the Feshbach resonance. And the nice thing about the attractive Hubbard model is it doesn't have a fermion sign problem for any filling. Okay? So basically the pairing mechanism here is just direct pairing because we have attractive <coughs> fermions. Uh, they pair at some temperature scale, T star, and then if you go to lower temperatures, they can, the, the pairs become superconducting. And there is basically a BBC BCS crossover as a function of the interacting, uh, str interaction strength. So as you go change this U over T, in the limit of weak U over T, or in the BCS limit, where you form, form momentum space pairs that condense into superfluid at sufficiently low temperatures. And at that limit, this T star, the pseudo gap temperature, agrees with uh, TC. Okay, so there's one place where you open up the gap and you become superconducting. If you now increase the interaction strength, uh, you can cross over to a BEC regime where the pairs are in real space. Um, and again, you can condense them out to, to a superfluid. And so in this far regime, the pairing is two-body. Okay? 
But there's this sort of intermediate regime where uh, the pairing is many body and uh, T star and T C are different. Okay. okay, so just to prepare you to see the data, uh, let me show you some, some uh, theory in the VCS limit. So uh, this is the dispersion of fermions in a, in a square lattice in the non, for a non-interacting gas. Okay, so this is energy versus quasi-momentum as I go through the brain zone from gamma point to x point to n and back. Okay, that's the dispersion here in the lattice. Now, if I start from the BCS limit and introduce weak attractive <coughs> interactions, you open up a gap at the Fermi surface, and what Arbus will measure is mostly this branch of the spectral function here, and a little bit of this branch, because this, branch, this upper branch is killed by the multiplication by the Fermi function. Okay, so how do we do ARPIS with this quantum gas microscope? Um, well, let's imagine, well, first we start with two spin states, spin up and spin down, that are interacting strongly with each other. And let's say this is the quasi-particle dispersion of the system here. Okay? So this is the unknown dispersion that we'd like to get. Now, instead of ejecting an atom from the system, what we do is we uh, we're, we make use of the fact that we have multiple hyperfine states for this atom. So we have spin up, spin down, but we also have additional states. In particular, we can pick a state which does not interact with the other two spin states. So if you transfer to that state, it's as if you've ejected the particle from the system. It's a non-interacting state. And we know what the dispersion, I told you, of this non-interacting state in the lattice is. Okay. So we can send in our radio frequency <coughs> photon, which is the appropriate energy scale for these systems. And it will cause a transition from the flip, a, so let's say, a spin up into this third non-interacting state. Now we need to know the energy and the dispersion, uh, and, the, and the momentum. Um, we know the energy of the final state. We know the energy of the photon that allows us to reconstruct the energy of, of the excitations of the system. And Turns out this radio frequency photon has a very long wavelength compared to the spacing between the particles, so it does not transfer any momentum. So we're essentially doing it vertical transitions in this diagram. So if we just measure the, the momentum of, these, of, uh, of the final state, this green state here, that tells us about the quasi-momentum initially. Okay? So this way we can reconstruct the, the dispersion uh, of the interacting system. Okay, so how do we measure the momentum? We, we just do a variant of time of flight. Uh, there are some particular complications because it's in a lattice, so we have to kind of first do a band mapping to convert the quasi-momentum to a real momentum, and then we can um, expand for a quarter period a harmonic trap, which now allows us to uh, convert this momentum to position, and then we image the position. Okay, so, so let me show you some data where we're looking now uh, at the system where we fix the temperature and we vary the, the interactions. And we're going to cross over from having no pseudo gap into a pseudo gap. Okay. So this is at an interaction of uh, minus 4 okay, and a temperature of 0.5. This is the experimental data. And this is uh, data from Tom <coughs> Rose group here at Stanford. And uh, you can see very good agreement. There's, this is the chemical potential here, uh, which we can extract again by fitting quantum Monte Carlo data to our equilibrium density profiles. And you can see in the limit of weak interactions, the spectral function, like the, the spectral weight approaches the, the <coughs> chemical potential. Okay, so there's no gap in this case. And now as you start to increase the interactions, you open up a gap. Okay. Now, and this agrees very well with the quantum Monte Carlo. Similarly, we can now scan the temperature while fixing the interaction. So this is starting from a regime of strong interactions, okay, where there is, there is a gap, and now we can increase the temperature. We start to see a second spectral branch occupied, and that's also seen in the Monte Carlo. So this is essentially breaking up pairs to singles. Okay. So, so basically, now we have the confidence that this ARPIS technique is working as it should. And we can now proceed to go and apply it to the repulsive Hubbard model and study the pseudo gap in that system. Okay, so, so let me uh, wrap up here. So what we've done in these experiments is we've we first um, we we've uh, used 
finesse matter techniques, uh, things like measuring resistivity, measuring uh, spectral function with, with ARPAS. Uh, in these uh, resistivity measurements, we've studied, we've observed this linear interior resistivity for the doped Hubbard system close to the critical point, uh, doping point that recuperates. Now there's the question of how uh, things change with doping, so we could now try to change the doping and we might expect to go into a Fermi liquid re uh, regime where you, s you expect to see this T squared, so that's something on our agenda. Um, with, with the ARPUS, I think things are now an exciting place, so uh, let me show you some DMFT phase diagram, which you might not have so much faith in now, quantitatively after I showed you the earlier data about the resistivity. <coughs> but, uh, so, so this is a DMFT phase diagram for the Hubbard model, and this is here the, the temperature um, for the pseudo gap T star. And uh, you can see as you lower the doping to zero, this T star approaches about like 0.25 or so. Okay? That's very close to where we are with the current experiments. We're like right now at 0.3. Maybe a little bit of entropy redistribution in our experiment. We can try to cool the system further and enter into the pseudo gap regime. Okay. There's already a lot of interesting things happening around this temperature <coughs> scale, like changes in the topology of the Fermi surface that one can obtain. If you just simply integrate the spectral functions, you get the momentum as a the density as a function of momentum, so you get the Fermi surface and you can try to see these kinds of things. But what I've told you so far has mostly been using, like I said, condensed matter tools. And we have this wonderful microscope that's not being used so far for the doped case. And it would be really exciting to start looking at, you know, comparing these various techniques. So let's say we have an unfermi liquid phase like the strange metal or we have a, we're in a pseudo gap regime. We verify we're there through these uh, bulk probes. And then we can go with a microscope and try to understand what is the thing that's characterizing these systems on the atomic level. Okay, is there some sort of order parameter? Is there some sort of correlation to the system? And so we have a lot of pictures. We don't know what to look for right now. And uh, what we're using right now is uh, we're collaborating with machine learning people uh, where we give them you know, a lot of these pictures and you can ask them to do various things. So you can take a picture, let's say, uh, of this uh, not very liquid and then just shuffle all the atoms around so that's like a garbage image and you can see can they train on these images and identify the real picture from a shuffled picture or you know, if, that, if it is training then if it's learning something about these pictures then we're learning that there is some sort of thing that tries in these pictures some sort of correlations or you can even try to let's say scan uh, the temperature and to be just above say the pseudo gap or just below is there a sudden enhancement in the learning in the machine learning that happens as we cross uh, this temperature scale that would again signal that there is some sort of order in these pictures that's appearing? And now, of course, there's an additional challenge of how to extract what these machines are learning. Um, so I have to say, we already like one of our collaborators is seeing pictures in this strange metal phase. Um, the machines are learning to distinguish a strange metal, but when we ask them what is it that they're finding, it's the, the pictures that they come up, come back to us with, or they're, they're nothing that you can easily distinguish in order to Okay, so uh, let me uh, conclude by thanking the people who did this work. So, uh, in particular, uh, a lot of this work has been done by Peter Brown and Elmer Guardado Sanchez, in collaboration with Postdoc Peter Schaus, who's now a faculty at the University of Virginia. We had a lot of wonderful theory support from the group of David Hughes at Princeton and various numerics groups. Andre Marie Tremblay did a lot of the DMFT work. Yuri Kokolic did the final temperature lunch for us. And here at Stanford, we've collaborated with Edwin Wang and Tom DeBerro. Thank you very much. I mean, I think factors of two, I mean, okay, so if you scale from the Cooper rates, we're a factor of five, maybe, above uh, the superconducting <coughs> temperature. So we've already bridged a huge, you know, orders of magnitude. Maybe this factor of five can be done. I think realistically, in the short term, maybe a factor of two can be achieved. 
I think the strength of these cold atom experiments is in studying like things like the normal states of the of the Hubbard model. Another thing might be instead of trying to get to lower temperatures, we can just try to change the Hamiltonian. So try to get something like a TJ model <coughs> where we can control T and J separately and get to enhance the critical temperature. So there's been like floquet techniques, for example, from the group of Tillman Esslinger where they succeeded in like engineering like a TJ model and I mean, maybe with our microscope we can go and look for correlations in this system. It might have a lot larger to see. Yeah, I mean, are there bosonic isotopes and maybe um, some of these cavity tricks uh, to advance <laughs> expert in? I would say the main technological challenge hasn't, it wouldn't be the artist, it would be actually, people have been doing these uh, experiments with, with driving and what is, they produce a lot of beautiful single particle results where we can show various in the engineering artificial gauge fields, etc. The challenge has been once they add interactions, these systems have that heat up to infinite temperature. Um, whether you can sort of work in some sort of pre-thermal regime like make sure the drive doesn't go too much heating over some time scale. That's I mean the theory itself it should be possible. Um, yeah, the experiments have to be done. So um, my interest. So it was very interesting that you saw the T linear um, mm -hmm. extracted inferred resistivity. Um, my understanding is that that's much more uh, general than uh, than just group rates. Uh, do you have any uh, speculation on uh, why it falls out of your, it seemed like in your picture it was coming from multiplying two quantities, neither of which had a simple dependence? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there might be different regimes of linear <coughs> T resistivity. We know there's a linear at high T, which we understand. There might be a different linear, which is the one that's exploring the cuprates, and this is yet a third linear here. Um, the, the slope of these lines that we're seeing is comparable like uh, with what they see in the coup rates like what would come out of uh, Plankian. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean this is the disadvantage of these simulators, they just give you the results, we don't really understand the physics. But it's, like a, you know, it's like you're doing a numerical simulation. Uh, we haven't explored the, the, the higher T linear, which would be at temperatures much higher than the bandwidth, um, just purely for technical reasons. I mean, eventually, if you heat up the gas so much, like right now, every time we heat up the gas, the density, since it's sitting in a trap, the density goes down, and we have to kind of make sure that it's like we're putting it in the box that keeps the density fixed. Um, so th that, that's been the, the main challenge, making sure that um, the density remains constant as we increase the temperature. Uh, if there are no further questions, let's thank uh, Dr. Hamilton.